Hi, and welcome to our fourth Universalist service video. My name is Ember Kelly, and I'm the Director of Religious Education here at the Fourth Universalist Society. I use she and her pronouns, and thank you so much for joining us. What follows are selections from our service on Sunday, January 16th, 2022. In this video, you'll hear the reading and the reflection, and following that, we hope you'll join us for a lively discussion where we go deeper into our service themes together. You're invited to check out our audio and video podcast each week. Post, we post these on our website, on our Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, as well as being available on most all of your favorite podcast streaming sites. If you like what you see, we do hope that you'll give us a positive review. The likes, the comments, the sharing, and subscribing, these all help to spread forth Universalist media further. Finally, we do acknowledge that while we may be in a virtual space right now, our community is located on the land of Munse Lenape peoples. With this acknowledgement, we seek to continue the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of oppression. We invite you to join us in this work as well as we embrace the eighth UU principle. Thank you so much for watching. We begin with our reading. Thank you so much, Sean. It's so important to hear these messages in, in many voices. Thank you for beginning us this morning. Our reading will be referenced in the sermon, as Sean has said, in relation to how these particular ver verses helped a woman who was suffering from COVID-19 cope with her illness. The reading is the 57th Psalm of David, the shepherd, the poet, the lyricist, the composer who would become the greatest king of Israel. David composed this while he was hiding in a cave from his enemy, King Saul. It is a prayer for help. Be merciful to me, be merciful because I come to you for safety. In the shadow of your wings, I find protection until the raging storms are over. I call to the Most High who supplies my every need, who will answer me from heaven and save me, who will defeat my oppressors, who will show me his constant love and faithfulness. I am surrounded by enemies who are like lions hungry for human flesh. Their teeth are like spears and arrows. Their tongues are like sharp swords. Show your greatness in the sky and your glory over all the earth. My enemies have spread a net to catch me. I am overcome with distress. They dug a pit in my path but fell into it themselves. I have complete confidence and I will sing and praise you. Wake up, my soul. Wake up, my harp and liar. I will wake to the sun. I will thank you among the nations. I will praise you among the people. Your constant love reaches the heavens. Your faithfulness touches the skies. Show your greatness in the sky and your glory over all the earth. Here ends our reading. It's the season for New Year's resolutions. And can you guess what the most popular resolutions are for 2022? According to one list I found, the top 10 resolutions allegedly are to lose weight, to improve one's diet, to get more exercise, to spend more time with family and friends, to have more self-awareness and take care of one's own mental health, to sort out one's finances and cut back on one's budget, to travel more often, to start a new hobby, sport, or interest, to be more environmentally aware, and to look for a new job. Do any of those match your own resolutions? The new year brings with it a sense of new possibilities and fresh starts. 
I tend to see every morning as bringing with it the possibility of bringing change and new possibilities. But nevertheless, a new year is a good time as any to encourage us to create meaningful change, if that is indeed our resolution. Not surprisingly, I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has also forced us, whether we wanted to or not, to adjust our lifestyles as well as our perspectives on daily living in a more drastic way than any new year ever has. Even after the COVID-19 pandemic eventually, one day, becomes merely endemic, think about all the changes which may persist not because of any mandate, but because our expectations on how we should live our lives will have shifted. Examples include wearing a mask in public during flu season or when you're feeling ill, dining outside, eating out less often, making reservations to visit a cultural institution, spending more time with pets, being used to accessing free healthcare as we've done with coronavirus testing, vaccines, and boosters, washing and sanitizing hands frequently, making more time for leisure, working remotely, saving money, having more awareness of public health, making appointments for telehealth, having a greater acceptance of our body's limits, and having a greater acceptance of needing time off for illness. A year ago, when vaccines were just starting to become available to increasing numbers of the public, we all had expectations for what life would be like a year later. I think few of us could have anticipated encountering an alphabet soup of Greek lettered variants passing by every three months or so. And yet, with a greater sense of security afforded by the vaccines against severe illness and hospitalization, have we gone back to living the way we did in the before times? Or have we had awakenings that brought positive changes? This pandemic has given all of us across the country and across the globe, the time and opportunity to think about life's big questions, like who am I? Whom can I trust? What can I hope for? Why do bad things happen to good people? or what will happen to me after I die. For those of us who have survived the pandemic thus far, our survival is like a kind of near-death experience and something that all people who have a near-death experience undergo is a change in one's outlook on life. The pandemic has been a kind of unveiling or uncovering of what we really believe, how we think we should live our lives and what really matters. The experience of going through the new year has some of these qualities too, but the pandemic has certainly heightened it. I'd like to share with you some quotes from people across our country who were interviewed by the journalist Elizabeth Diaz on just this topic about how the experience of the pandemic has made people resolve to either think or do things differently. I hope that some of these quotes might resonate with your own experience or might help you consider new ways of thinking about life. A woman from Missouri said, I care much more about being with people who make me feel whole now. The pandemic scraped away all facades we've built around our lives. A woman from Nebraska said, my husband quit his job and we moved to his hometown. No one yells every day anymore. I have come to the realization that maybe I deserve to be happy too. A woman from Minnesota said, we had an unplanned pregnancy. I've experienced grief because I never realized what you give up to be a new parent. But I would give up all of those things again and again for my son. I think the pandemic helped this new transition we had so much we had to give up that it softened the blow a bit. A man from Illinois said, I applied to over 400 jobs. It feels like there's no way to catch up, let alone get ahead. 
I focus on enjoying the little things because those are the things I can control. A woman from Wisconsin said, the pandemic has forced me into the present. It's the meditation I never wanted but have come to appreciate. That said, last week I kicked a hole in the bathroom door. A woman from the District of Columbia said, I made a vow not to skip another Christmas or Japanese New Year with my parents. I don't know how many I'll have left with them. A woman in Virginia said, I don't skip walks with my husband just because I'm tired. A man from Tennessee said, coming out of this, I realized emotions can't wait for another day. I'm calling my parents more and expressing my love and gratitude to them. A man in California said, I've completely lost interest in traveling. I think most about wanting to have friends over in our home. For me, looking forward is all about making my deep roots here even deeper. A woman from Louisiana said, well, I was just a few weeks into maternity leave. I was the first person to be let go from my office. It's a disgusting feeling, nausea followed by rage. My husband and I are running a business together now, but one thing is clear, we will never be someone else's employees again. Finally, I'd like to share with you the story of Joelle Wright Terry, who works as a hospice chaplain in Michigan, who herself is a COVID survivor. She lost her husband to the virus last year, and this is her story in her own words. Our COVID story started with us both having a horrific cough. My husband had type one diabetes. I had a fever of 104. I have never been that sick in my life. My husband drove me to the hospital. I came back the same day. That night, he drove himself back to the hospital. Before he left, he turned to the boys and told them to take care of your mom. A couple of days later, the doctors put him on oxygen. His chest was hurting so bad, and by that time, my COVID had kicked in full force. We could barely talk to each other. We basically suffered in silence. Then he started to really decline. We FaceTimed and told him how good a husband and father he was. And we reminded him how much we loved him. That was at one o'clock on the 2nd of April. My husband let go at 8.50 that evening. I honestly thought I was going to pass away at home. I kept saying, I do not want to leave the boys. I do not want to die in front of them. COVID is a kind of warfare that changes you. The only thing that got me through was Psalm 57. The virus attacks your mind. It attacks your muscles. It attacks your joints. It attacks your lungs. It is a pain that I've never felt in my life. And I've had surgeries and I have had cancer. You can't go back to living the same life after surviving COVID. My husband took care of us. He never missed a beat with the boys going to their school functions. He worked as a business owner, making gravestones and monuments. He left behind 100 orders, some COVID victims. I looked at the number of orders and I began to pray. I emptied out my entire savings to try to save our business and keep this legacy going. Now we, the boys and I, are learning the gravestone business. I have been strengthened by the testimonies of other widows who have come into my shop and we sit there and we grieve together. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, I am not sure how I would have made it. I'm a volunteer minister at my church. I often presided over the funerals. Never in a million years did I think I would be sitting on the front pew with my husband lying before me as other families have done. 
I never, never imagined that I would be sitting there with a minister speaking scripture and praying and eulogizing as I have done for families. The pandemic, my husband's death, and God have taught me to appreciate our loved ones. I've already told my boys, we've got to figure out a way to get to Alabama to see my mother and sisters more often because family is just so important. My husband died a year ago. I know I am becoming someone different. I just don't know what that difference will be yet. I know I was a wife and now I am 47 years old and a widow. End quote. Through it all, despite all the illness and mortality the pandemic has brought, the world and its work haven't stopped. Though places of employment are short-staffed, economies are struggling, supply chains are interrupted, and healthcare resources are strained, the sun still rises and sets every day, just as surely as the days and months on the calendar pass by in their orderly rhythm. Just as we can't know with any certainty what we will experience in this new year, we still aren't quite sure what new changes and transformations this experience of the pandemic will have on us and our societies long term. The process of reflection is just beginning and where it goes is open ended. In the meantime, as we reflect in this new year on who we are and who we want to resolve to become, we can always draw on the spiritual strength that Joel Wright Terry testified about. A grander view that the psalmist says will usher us from the raging storms to awakening with the dawn. Thank you. Oh, it's so great today to get to sit down with Reverend Mark, one of our affiliate ministers who is covering Skyota's family leave uh, during these three months. And I'm just so excited for this opportunity uh, to get to sit down with you again. It's, it's been a little while since we got to sit down for one of these. It has been, Ember. I mean, certainly we've seen each other, but I haven't uh, been in the pulpit lately. So I'm you know, glad that we get to have this opportunity. I think the last time we did this was probably at the end of the summer uh, 2021. So happy new year. An, an, another world, August 20, August 2021. <laughs> yes, pre-Omicron. Oh, that was like mid-Delta. Anyways, anyways, yeah. don't, I don't want to get stuck on all of our variants here. Um, but for Even my first I question, I, I tasked you as we as we prepared, I tasked you to know thyself. Uh, <laughs> so would, would you like to introduce uh, yourself to maybe any listeners and watchers who haven't gotten the chance to get to know you? No problem. Well, for anyone who, who hasn't met me yet, who's watching this, I'm the Reverend Mark Cotolo. And uh, normally I'm an affiliate com affiliate community minister at Fourth Universalist. But uh, from until March 2022, I'm serving as the covering, one of the two family covering uh, leave ministers um, uh, while, while Skylar is away uh, temporarily. Um, and for those who don't know me, I'm, I'm also a social worker. I work with uh, young adults and, and mental health. And that's something that I'm passionate about. I also serve another UU congregation uh, in the suburbs part time and um, proud New Yorker here. And um, yeah, passionate about liberal religion. So New Year's, New Year's. We're, we're technically two weeks in, but it also at the same time kind of feels like it just started because uh, it's, it's been a heck of a year so far already. Um, what, yeah. what inspired a message about New Year's? What, what, as you, as you sat to prep for this, what, what, why that theme? Absolutely. So, you know, on the one hand, talking about the new year in January is kind of cliche. Uh, however, at the same time, um, you know, I, I, uh, I read a, fa a fabulous uh, article by the journalist Elizabeth Diaz in the newspaper, and, and she was writing about how the pandemic has changed people um, and, you know, New Year's, uh, people kind of force themselves to change things in the new year uh, mm -hmm. by making resolutions. And the pandemic has also forced people to change things. So I saw that there was a, a aspect of commonality there. So I thought, why not to talk about um, 
what it is that people may be doing differently, either because of New Year's resolutions or because of the pandemic and what what we might want to change, but also what you know may not be a lasting change. Because we also know that just because you resolve to do something doesn't mean that it'll happen or that it'll happen long term. Uh, so that that's what inspired me. Ah, oh, that makes sense to me. And I mean, that, it had me thinking as you were as you were speaking there. I was thinking about how, you know, e- even as we returned to in person for that for that little window there, um, yep. we still kept the hybrid because it was something that we had discovered um, helped further and bro- broaden. That's the word I'm looking for. Broaden our community. Um, yeah. We, yeah. we, during this pandemic, we've, we've had experiences, you know, whether it's masks now or, um, so many, I mean, so many different things, social distancing, uh, you know, I, I kind of wish we could go back to having a little bit more distance in grocery lines. Um, that, oh that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's kind of fallen away. Well, that's a perfect example. Like that's something that, um, you know, we did for a really long time and out of nowhere, right, many supermarkets have removed the the tape from the floor that, you know, shows where you should stand and how far away you should stand from one another. Uh, so that was not a lasting change. And, you know, a year ago, I wouldn't have predicted one way or the other whether that was a change that would, you know, stick. And, you know, whether it's management or, you know, just people's preferences, um, that is not a change that is long lasting. Right. I, I've, I know, you know, we, the end of the pandemic still feels a little far away. Um, but I've, yeah. I've wondered, you know, once this is less of a worry, um, will I still, like, if I get sick, think, hey, maybe I should wear a mask to stop from spreading this to other people. Uh, you know, that uh, we, we, I was out at the grocery store yesterday picking up, um, picking up a few things and uh, walking down the aisle and this lady's just sneezing. I'm like, oh my gosh, look, uh, why are you doing this to me? This is why I'm wearing a mask. Maybe I should just keep doing this even afterwards. Um, and yes. I mean, I guess that's a little bit to do with spending time in Asia where that's much more common socially to, to yes. do that. But, um, yes. you know, it's little yeah. things like that that maybe we will hold on to even a- after things calm down. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would predict that that actually is the case. Um, I was actually just reading a, a piece this weekend about how, you know, in East Asian cultures that it is more common to see people wearing masks uh, in general. Um you know, not because they don't want to be seen by other people, but just from a health perspective and um, people who live in some of those countries have more experience than we do of living through, um, you know, pandemics. And it's kind of, you know, ingrained culturally at this point. And we may become like that, of course, um, you know, people who weren't inclined to wear masks over the past few years are not going to suddenly take it up, you know, during flu season moving forward. Um, but for those who, you know, um, have done it and, and, I won't say enjoy doing it, but, um, you know, we're, we're okay with it or appreciated the significance of it or, you know, the health benefits of it. Um, those people uh, very well may continue to do that during flu season or if you're not personally not feeling well. Um, but also, you know, if people aren't feeling well moving forward, there may be greater acceptance of staying home. Right. I mean, in the past, you know, there's always this push to to push forward and show up to school or show up to work anyway, even if you don't feel too well. And, um, you know, now people, I hope, uh, will feel more comfortable with, you know, recognizing our body's limits and that it's important to rest and recover. I hope mm-hmm. that's a lesson that will continue to, um, you know, to, to be a lesson learned, but time will tell. Oh gosh, I hope so on that one. Uh, I mean, you know, all the, especially in my in my past years working retail, you know, I'd it could have been that my arm was like literally chopped off of the saw, and I would have been like, okay, I better make it into work today. Um, yeah, <laughs> like yes. it's so ingrained in our American culture this this notion of of uh, never taking a sick day unless you want to. Um, and yeah, yeah, hopefully, hopefully that one changes. I, I hope so too. And, you know, there may have been seeds of that, you know, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, just speaking about here in New York City. Um, and I don't know if it was a two years or three years or four years before the um, before the pandemic started, New York City passed a law um, where city council approved that all New Yorkers, regardless of what job you work, uh, whether you're unionized, not unionized, office job, not office job, gig economy, whatever, um, every New Yorker is entitled to five days of paid sick leave in during the year. Um, and 
whether your employer offers it, offers it officially or not, everyone gets that. And so, um, you know, now we're talking about, you know, if you get coronavirus, um, you know, do you have to quarantine for 10 days versus five days, whatever that is, um, you know, uh, however that shifts, it is important to take time off, not just, you know, obviously you don't want to get other people sick, but also, you know, to focus on your own recovery and, and not wear yourself down. You know, I think there there's a sense that hopefully there is some some consciousness, some awareness being raised around these sort of things. You've mentioned a few uh, different pieces. Um, I wonder if there's any specific, uh, whether it's those articles or maybe other books, other texts that you really dove into as you prepared for this message today. Sure. Um, one of the texts that I really dove into uh, deeply was actually Psalm 57. Um, that's the reading for today's um, service. And the reason why I picked it, uh, I mean, you'll see soon, but um, one of the quotes, there's a testimony that uh, the journalist, um, you know, wrote down uh, of this woman who um, got really sick during the pandemic. Her whole, her family did. Um, I won't give too much away, but she was in a really um, tough, she just had a really tough experience uh, during the pandemic. And the thing that got her through it, she said, was reading Psalm 57 over and over and over again. And that was what gave her spiritual sustenance to push through and to ultimately recover and to, you know, to be there for her kids. Um, you know, if you read Psalm 57, it's basically a plea for help. Um, it's, you know, ascribed to King David in the context of him hiding in a cave from his enemy, King Saul, and, um, you know, really praying for um, divine protection, you know, feeling like, you know, they're out to get me, the lions, they're surrounding me, I can, you know, see and hear their big teeth, they're, they're you know, I'm in deep danger, please save me, and, um, and, and that's what it is, and so reading that, you know, <sighs> most of us most of the time don't feel persecuted or like people are out to get us or that people are chasing after us necessarily um but sometimes or for some people it does feel that way and you know COVID-19 is not necessarily out to get any of us personally it's there's nothing personal about you know the germ the germ is just infecting our bodies to reproduce and to you know that's what viruses do um but for us it feels personal or it can feel personal because it's happening to us. So how do people deal with that? And for this one particular person who I'm going to talk about in my sermon, um, Psalm 57 was um, one of the keys to her emotional and spiritual recovery. I suppose my final question is perhaps a little bit more lighthearted. And that is, do you have any New Year's resolutions that you'd like to, to share that are things that you are working on in this new year? Yeah, thanks for asking. So actually, I'm a little bit anti New Year's resolutions, not to say that other people shouldn't do it. I support whether you do it or don't do it, that whatever works for you works for me. Uh, but for me personally, I don't make any resolutions um, for the new year, because from my perspective, um, you know, the difference between December to January is very arbitrary. Um, so for me, if there's something that I that's really important to me that I really do want to change um, that I'm really committed to. I see every morning as being an opportunity to create change um, with the changing of the day, the rising of the sun. Um, you know, today is the day. If I want to create change, I can do it today. I don't have to wait till tomorrow or next week or next year. This morning is a perfect opportunity to create change. So that that's how I see the world. Oh, that makes sense. I think, you know, one of the beautiful things about, um, especially maybe like more more earth centered spiritualities too is thinking about these cycles and you know while we may have these arbitrary dates like ah December thirty first to first that's this is this is when we got to make these promises but every every day uh, every start of one of these new daily cycles a new week a new month these, yeah. these can all be opportunities for us to really uh, step back and reflect I know uh, um, yeah I do a lot of journaling and that's you know yeah. kind of where I find that opportunity to step back. Um, I may at the beginning of the year kind of set out some some hopes for the year, uh, but then that can be something that I then check in on throughout the course of the year. Um, or that's how it becomes a more solid habit. Mine for this year is to, um, it, it, I'm aiming it for it to be a year of a little bit better self care. That's that's my okay. Um, that's yeah. my hope for for this year. 
That's great. Well, and if you need any support in that, feel free to reach out, but I'm definitely rooting for you. And we'd love to hear yours in the comments, listeners. Uh, feel free to, to drop a comment telling us uh, what, what your New Year's resolution is, if you are someone who practices that. Um, but Reverend Mark, it's been so great to get to sit down again. Absolutely. Thank you, Ember. And thanks as always to all of our listeners.